Hello, everybody. So last time we didn't quite get to um, kind of the introduction to drinking water, why we care, how we, how we go about it, things like that. So today we'll, we'll start there. Um, we'll get into our first um, water treatment technology, um, actual specific technology, which would be sedimentation. Um, so we'll probably get a fair bit through sedimentation, the, the math we're going to use behind it, how we can understand it. And next time we'll, we'll do some practice with sedimentation and probably start on um, looking at a way to enhance sedimentation with what we call coagulation. So um, if you didn't notice, there is a homework posted that's um, due uh, Tuesday. I'll post another homework that day. It'll be due the following week. And then that, when that, that day that that one is due, um, that'll be our exam review for the, the first exam. So that's kind of where we are right now. I think we're okay on the schedule. Um, if you have any questions, just let me know as we're getting going. <clears throat> okay, so today we're gonna start with the drinking water stuff. And this really is um, kind of the closest or the, um, I guess I have the most training in drinking water side of water treatment. So this does certainly hit close to home and I've had I even I've even taken a couple of public health courses uh, back when I was in grad school across enrolled with a public health school and it was kind of interesting to see uh, their view on the types of work we do as environmental engineers except as it relates to health and one of the things that they they described um, quite vividly was the fecal oral route of transmission so as we're starting to think about water treatment, one of the most fundamental things that we're trying to stop is stop um, any possible way that we're ingesting animal or human excrement. Um, sounds nasty, but that's really, really what we're up against um, for disease, at, at least. Obviously, there's some other concerns. You don't want to drink water that's contaminated with lead or something like that. Um, so there's certainly other things that are important, but kind of the fundamentals and where, where we began with the technology, in some sense, really has to do with disrupting what, what you'd call the fecal oral route of transmission. So if we were to sketch this um, with my amazing drawing skills here, um, can imagine what this might be. Toilet, right? So if we think about what happens when we flush the toilet, well, theoretically, it's going to go out and be discharged. Hopefully we have some sort of treatment, but ultimately it's making its way perhaps into some river, right? So we have some river flowing along, fish and all that, and then eventually somebody's going to want to drink that water or want to drink water. So they're probably going to tap into this or maybe some groundwater that's up next to this. Maybe it's discharged to the groundwater and then this is all underground. In any case, you have that and then maybe you have some sort of animals here. I don't even know what I'm drawing exactly. It's just going to be a little stick figure. Maybe it's a deer. Some sort of animal and of course it also defecates. So we have fecal matter entering our, our waterways and that's a problem because a lot of diseases are transferred through this fecal oral route of transmission. So if then we say um, we're going to take this water and then We want to drink it. You know that that becomes a problem. We can see clearly why that would be a problem, because now it's contaminated with stuff that's going to make us sick. So, you know, 200 years ago we didn't know we we knew that you know excrement was gross and it smells bad, but we didn't actually have the the full germ theory. That was actually kind of really began in the 1850s. Um, coincidentally, there was a guy named John Snow. Uh, John with a J-O-H-N. Um, we, we call him the father of epidemiology because he's the first one that um, really recognized that an, a cholera outbreak was sourced to a contaminated drinking water well in London. Um, I, think, I think I'll bring that up again um, later in the course um, when we get to disinfection, but it's, it's really an interesting story. And 
So we haven't actually known how bad this, this route of transmission is or the, have the germ theory behind it. So anyway, as we're thinking about drinking water treatment and water treatment in general, I like to start with this because we, we want two barriers. We, we want to have a barrier here. Um, try that again. We want a barrier here to prevent whatever we discharge from contaminating the water too much. And we want a second barrier right here because we can't really control where the animals are defecating and whatever, what else is in the water. So if we think about it this way, then we have our wastewater treatment here. And then we have our drinking water treatment here, which is kind of what we're going to be talking about. And one thing you'll notice as we go is there's a couple of different, a different, some different motivating factors, right? If we are looking at our drinking water treatment, we really want to protect health. That is the primary goal. This needs to be safe for consumption. Um, sometimes this overlaps with an industry that wants to have clean water for whatever they're using the water for. Lots of industries use water to wash things or to um, allow processes to go through. And, you know, an industry might take um, tap water and say, okay, this is pretty good. Maybe we'll remove the chlorine and then we'll be okay. Or maybe they need to do some other special stuff because it's not pure enough. Or maybe they don't care so much. Um, so sometimes that overlaps with industry concerns. Um, for drinking, it really is health. Um, for wastewater, uh, we'll talk about this in more detail, but it's essentially we want to protect whatever we might want to use the rivers and streams groundwater for. So it's an intended use protection. It's okay if there are some pathogens so long as it's still safe to swim in, right? So we don't have to have the same stringent standards because we recognize the rivers are already going to have some pathogens or some, uh, some bacteria, stuff like that. It may not matter so much that we attain that same level of treatment standards, um, you know, so long as we're protecting um, all the things that we like about our waterways. Um, and on that note, we, you know, we will, we will talk about it, but the things we like are typically, you know, uh, recreation, swimming, fishing, um, the aquatic life, just having it there. We, you know, humanity enjoys having uh, nice environments to visit, to look at, to have, and there's just lots of benefits that we care about. So, okay, so when we think about where we're getting the water, that often drives how we're going to treat it. Because if you have very pure glacial melt water, then you don't really have to treat it much because it's, it's just basically snow that has condensed and it, you know, has formed in a relatively um, clean environment. And there really probably is not too much, too much contamination there. Um, so if you think about that and compare that to uh, drinking from the Mississippi, down here in Louisiana, that's that's a completely different story. There's a lot of different inputs that are uh, creating um, contaminants and other factors that you want to consider uh, that you might not want to drink. So depending on where you're getting your water, um, here in Baton Rouge, a lot of our water is coming from the from groundwater sources. It's relatively clean. The uh, ground soil, um, the soil structure, and the just the nature of groundwater tends to provide some natural filtration. Uh, we make use of that fairly often, but we're still gonna wanna add some chlorine, keep it disinfected, um, make sure that in the distribution system itself, we're not gonna have um, pathogens growing. Okay, and of course, you could look at seawater, something like that. Seawater, you have to desalinate. That's possible, it just takes quite a lot of energy. So that's usually, usually not done unless it's the you know, it's cost effective in terms of getting water from some other source. Okay, so that's just kind of wanted to provide that context here because it, the types of treatment that we're going to design would, you know, and does depend on where we're getting the water from. In, in our case, in our class, we're not really going to be making that decision. We're just going to have, okay, here's, here's the conditions, here's the technology, what are we going to do with it? But um, 
if you were ever to show up at a random place and start thinking about what kind of water treatment you need, you'd have to take a look at, okay, what's in the water in the first place? Is there, are there a lot of particles? What's going on? What needs to be treated? Okay, so for the water treatment system, kind of a schematic here, how we typically um, look at it. Um, this is from our book. Uh, you got a question? Yeah, so the question was, and for the people watching online, the question is which one's kind of most expensive and um, comparing glacial water um, desalination uh, and the potential for running out of groundwater. So I would say that the desalination, um, the costs are energy first of all, because you, you just have to use a lot of energy to force the water away from the salts because osmotic pressure, we'll talk about that a little bit when we cover membranes. Um, so that's usually the most costly and it also produces lots of highly salty water that you have to dispose of somewhere. Um, and so that can have an, an ecological impact as well. Then um, groundwater, there are some regions where it is more like a mineral resource, like you said, where if we keep extracting and extracting, then it, it will be depleted. Most in most places, we have groundwater that replenishes. Um, so most often, you know, the rain infiltration, different processes will be recharging that. And then maybe you have a, an imbalance um, and you have to go a little deeper or um, pump a little, you know, which would require a little more pressure. The groundwater is relatively cheap to extract, but there's, you know, if you're in New Mexico or somewhere, you might, you might have a finite supply that's not recharging. And that, that's certainly a concern. It's a good question. Okay, so if we think back about the little diagram I sketched um, with the toilets and all, um, really what, the, what we're looking at here is kind of the same, same type of deal we have. If we're taking water in for using it, this would be that first barrier. It comes in, we have our water treatment. We can take it from a stream, a reservoir, or maybe a groundwater well. Um, and this is, you know, where we're putting our barrier is this water treatment plant. So regardless of where we're taking it from, we want that, that first barrier. Um, the schematic is kind of flipped because we're looking at it drinking first and then using and then dis discharging. So when we, take, when we take water and a municipal water supply, usually some of it will be used by industry. Um, a lot of it will then go to homes, perhaps to watering your lawn and then it's essentially escaping the, uh, the loop here. Um, and then it's discharged or you know sends, gets sent from the houses, from the in industry to wastewater. Maybe if the industry is adding something nasty to the water, they have to pre-treat it, make sure they're not dumping uh, heavy metals, something like that into the wastewater treatment plant that is not designed to handle it. Um, but then it goes to the wastewater treatment facility and then ultimately discharged, and this is that second barrier. Now, sometimes, and I, I think this is not true of Baton Rouge, um, some cities still have storm sewers that are combined with the municipal sewers. That was never a good idea, but it would collect any runoff from the roadways that you know may be dirty and you might want to clean it up a bit. But it really um, gives the potential for a flood to flood the wastewater treatment plant, and that's just a disaster. You don't want untreated water coming back out of sewers and things like that. So that that's just um, not a pleasant thing. So this is um, an artifact of how some systems used to be designed, no longer, we're no longer designing any that way. Instead, we have what we call storm separated, uh, excuse me, separated storm sewer systems. Okay, um, one thing I want to note here is if you're if you're in a place where there's water scarcity let's say California uh, Singapore is a good example um, you know there's there's a lot of a lot of people will be very concerned about how much water you're using and there's some truth to that 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 uh, you don't want to waste the water but really the 
the biggest deal if you're concerned about the let's say a stream or a river being depleted if you're drawing down a bunch of water here and then adding most of that back here there is this stretch where there's going to be a big problem with a drawdown right between those two points however if you're just taking a, a very long shower you're effectively just drawing this a little bit further than it would have been and then sending most of that straight back into it there's going to be some water losses um, and some considerations there um, but it's not you know it's not correct to think that it's just completely wasted um, you know that's, that's something that is worth worth um, considering now if you're watering your lawn in the middle of a hot day and it's just all evaporating that is much more of a, a waste and that's why you know if you were to um, be in a drought prone area you might you might find lawn watering ordinances stuff like that um, there was a couple summers growing up in Georgia that we actually had to do that uh, where we were supposed to not not water on certain days just because our, our water supplies were um, a little bit finite and needed um, needed rain to recharge them okay so what impact does this um, preventing that fecal oral route of transmission have well we can really see a, a, a big difference if we take a look at data shown here on typhoid fever so typhoid fever um, is a fecal oral route of transmission disease if you if you travel to a developing country you will usually um, be told that you ought to get a typhoid fever vaccine um, this is you know the way you get it you know fecal oral can be through a river or it could be um, improper hygiene somebody prepares your food and then you eat that and you um, you know we, we have some diseases still here that have outbreaks like that like norovirus something like that so there are cases, but it's no longer, uh, you know, 20 to 30 deaths per 100,000 population every year. So if we look at back in 1900, where we didn't have chlorination. And then when we started chlorination and we began uh, to, um, to use many more um, hygiene practices and chlorination became widespread, we really see this falling off and the, this barrier um, to, to that route of transmission is really um, what we attribute to the fact that we went from quite a few deaths every year um, to not, not so many at all. So it's just a, a nice demonstration here of why that's important um, and I guess how we can, how we can move forward in, um, in places that are still uh, plagued by, by this and other diseases. Okay, so the Safe Drinking Water Act in 1974 really formalized a lot of our uh, drinking water standards. There were some um, other formulations, uh, I don't remember their names before this, that kind of led to this, but ultimately this is, this is the one that really was put in place and is um, kind of drives most of our regulation uh, today for, on the drinking water side. And the, the standards really are about toxins and pathogens so we have um, treatment standards so that we can be um, assured that certain pathogens are um, inactivated or destroyed uh, to a, enough of an extent that they're no longer present in infectious quantities so that's uh, one big thing and obviously we don't want to drink anything toxic in toxic amounts so when we think about the different types of things in water and you know if I could use my water bottle here as an example um, I just filled this up upstairs in one of the water fountains that has little cups to tell you not to use them um, if you think about what's in here um, you know maybe maybe it's been a very busy couple weeks for me uh, moving into a new house which is which is true and I, I don't know when the last time I washed this was. I, I generally rinse it out before I use it, but it's probably not as clean as, you know, maybe I, I would want it. 
but I'm still drinking from it. And you know, I, I leave a little bit of saliva, so who knows what's in it. The point, the important point here is that it probably doesn't have, and in fact, I'm sure that it doesn't have enough bad stuff to actually make a difference to my health. Okay, so that's one, one thing that we consider in our drinking water treatment is maybe there's a couple pathogens in here. And I say a couple, and I mean a couple cells or a couple virus particles. Um, so long as there's not enough to give me an infectious dose to actually make me sick, I don't really care. Um, and in terms of our, our standards, they're built that way as well. As long as we are sure that there's not enough bad stuff to make anybody sick, we're okay. Um, and of course we build in a bit of a safety factor. So really the, the health standards is the big, um, is the big thing. We wanna, um, we have these what we call primary standards and they regulate for any health effects. These are enforceable by law and if they're not being met then people get in trouble, municipalities get fined, all that kind of stuff. These really um, pertain to chemical type stuff, again toxins, radionuclides, obviously it again toxins, and microbial contaminations which are you know, what we would usually link to pathogens, although some microbes can produce toxins. And we could talk about how the, there's a difference between food infections and food poisoning, it's toxin versus just um, pathogens uh, infecting you. But essentially, those are the three categories of um, standards that we, we think about when we, we say, okay, is this water clean? Okay, what chemicals are in it? Are, are we sure that there are no bad chemicals in it, microbes in it, all that stuff? You got a question? That's a good question, and for those online, the question was, do, do these standards change for bacteria or other pathogens that might build resistance um, to, uh, towards us or yeah. just toward, in general? So usually the, the technologies we use to um, eliminate pathogens, it, there, there are some cases where there's some resistance. So we, we might use chlorine, which is an oxidation reaction. It's a lot different than an antibiotic. It just destroys stuff uh, in a sense. It's a chemical reaction, whereas an antibiotic maybe disrupts a cellular process and maybe some bacteria get used to that. So we don't use antibiotics for, for disinfection. Uh, we use a little, something a little bit more crude and a little bit more like a, a hammer that's just gonna destroy it. One thing that we do use is ultraviolet light and sometimes bacteria can repair themselves afterwards after being exposed to ultraviolet light. Um, so what, what we do then is we make sure that we have a little bit of residual chlorine in the system to keep them down. And we also make sure that we've disinfected them to a level where we're pretty confident that even if a few of them repaired themselves, there should be no problem. It's a good question. Okay, so there's a, a second um, set of standards we have, uh, we call secondary standards, that are really aesthetic. Um, so if, again, using my water bottle, if I were to put some food coloring in here, um, some food safe, non-toxic food coloring, and then basically serve that through a water fountain, it's probably going to meet the standards, even though it's some funky color. Uh, you could think of the same thing sort of if you had a little bit of tea, you know, a faint tint of tea coloring in your, in your water. Um, that little bit of organic matter gives it a color, maybe even a little bit of a flavor or a, an odor. And as long as it's health safe, it's actually gonna meet our primary standards. Meaning, you know, we might have these aesthetic standards that say, okay, this, this perhaps is no good, um, we don't like that, but it's not enforceable. A, a treatment system can legally distribute brown, green, um, basically any color water because color itself, so long as there's no health, health effects involved, um, is not enforceable. Okay, I got a question or a yeah, question from online saying, when I lived in Monroe, I often got letters from the city saying not to drink the tap water. Um, and then the question is, what causes the city to not be able to properly treat the, the water? It's a good question. We're going to actually go through a little bit more of that in um, when we reach disinfection. But 
uh, kind of a quick answer right now is these boil water advisories or do not drink advisories will be given sometimes when uh, maybe a water main breaks and they're worried that groundwater, which is who knows how dirty, is infiltrating into the pipe system and they need to allow a certain amount of time to flush it out. So that, that's one thing that could happen. Sometimes a source, whatever source water you're using, maybe there's a, a big rain event and it gets kind of kicks up a lot of sediment and a lot of junk and they're not able to purify it to the degree that they should you know they're doing their best and then they realize they didn't clean it enough and they have too many um, we call them coliforms bacteria counts when they measure them uh, water's going through they, they routinely measure so every day they're measuring and they say oops we have so many we had a lot grow today that means the water we treated yesterday is not safe um, so sometimes that'll happen a lot of times it'll be like a water main break could be uh, it'd be very rare but it could be like a some issue with the actual treatment plant that went wrong. Okay, good question. Um, okay, so these secondary standards, um, they're not enforceable, so there, there are some interesting things there. Uh, one thing, hardness uh, is a good example of something that um, you probably are aware of in some way, but didn't recognize it. And it's uh, something that's kind of a convenience factor so water hardness is um, really a, an estimate of sorts of